Hey, sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown and Court Call with Ronnie Nunn. As we all know, Ronnie was an NBA referee for 20 years, five more years as head of officials, and then spent three more as the director of development. So, Ronnie, you know your stuff on these rules, and man, do we have some rules to go over from last night. Well... Uh, yeah, I, I hope I can keep up with them all because uh, there's a lot of rules in place and a lot of instances of things happening and not, not an easy rule thing to follow in this uh, sequence of events. I, I agree. And probably some things that no one's ever really had to deal with before. So we don't have to jump into a very big stretch of time on this game. The last 13 and a half seconds on the inbound with um, OKC trying to get the ball inbounds. And um, let's just break into it because what we have here on the list of the calls that the NBA went over, it's an interesting list, and they, they decided, decided to you know, grade each call. The first thing we're going to look at is Manu Ginobili defending the inbounder and stepping on the line. So what do you see on here, and did you feel like this merited a call of a delay of game? Uh, the first thing going on is Ginobili touches the line as a defender. And when you... Um, you touch the line. I had a little bit of an issue in the wording. I, it usually says something in the uh, in the rule book that says something about going over the line or over the plane. And I thought touching was not uh, as as big a deal uh, as long as your toe didn't go over. But apparently they believed, and I and I would agree, no problem, that touching the line as a defender is an immediate delay of game. So that's the first action, and that's when play should have stopped. Now the only thing I can say is. Um, did the, uh, did the offensive player, Waiters, have enough room to step back and clear himself so he can get more of a cushion between Ginobili being at the line and him making an, in, you know, an inbounded uh, ball? So most officials will mark off a spot. It doesn't, it's not necessarily three feet. A lot of people talk about it. But they mark off an area and say, listen, you can't go as a defender past this imaginary plane I'm giving you. Uh, I don't know if that occurred because if that occurred, then the call should have been immediate and not having to worry about whether he got to the line. So either way, fans should know that, that when they see that, that that's an imaginary line that the official is marking. By the, same, by the same token, waiters stayed at that position. That may have meant that he couldn't go back or didn't think of going back. So to answer your first question, delay a game, Ginobili. Delay a game in the last two minutes of the fourth or overtimes is an automatic technical foul. There's no... Uh, delay where you get a warning during the course of the game you get a warning on your first delay on this one no it's immediate in the last two minutes and I was surprised by that as we were going through this and I had not recalled that new insertion so uh, I, I need to keep up myself on rules fair enough I mean I would have to say that that toe on the line would doesn't necessarily get bubble up enough to merit a whistle I truly think in that situation you know, the, the arms really don't come across that in, that invisible plane going straight up. So I, I don't know. To me, I could almost see that being a correct no call. Simply, he is pressuring the ball, uh, you know, and, and he doesn't, you know, it doesn't even get over all the way over the line. It's literally like a toe. So I would say that, you know, I, I don't see why that merited a call. But, but that brings us to the next part of it because this becomes crazy. We then have waiters crossing the plane on his own thing, and not only that, but making some significant contact to create an advantage and get open enough to make a pass. Remember, they didn't have a timeout and a timeout left, so that would have been devastating for a five-second call. What are your thoughts on that? Did that merit enough to be either a foul or a violation? Well, you know, I thought really, uh, to keep it simple, I thought really it was a violation for him to come across and make contact with the defender. Uh, you know, Ginobili's a flopper too, so I also thought it was only the ball. As I later looked, it was the forearm. So it looks a little bit more like a foul in all fairness to that. Uh, I have never had a play where the throw in commits an offensive foul. Uh, <laughs> could I think it could happen? Yeah, I was thinking about uh, trying to throw into somebody and the defender runs his teammate off the court and, uh, and all of a sudden he sees that happening and he moves his body to protect his teammate while he's off the court. And yes, that could be an offensive foul. So this is this is good to know. This is an insertion I had not seen before. I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, uh, you know, Chris Weber yelled out offensive foul. The NBA responded with offensive foul. I was thinking more violation, but I can live with an offensive foul if, if the contact is in there and we deem it as uh, an illegal act. Okay. So, okay, okay offensive foul. 
is good. That means the ball would be taken away immediately, no shots to be taken, and, of course, San Antonio would get the ball. So there's your second event. Okay, now it gets a little bit crazier because then there is a correct no call on the waiters leaving his feet to make a pass. And we see the rule on the screen which says that uh, provided the player doesn't leave the designated throw-in spot laterally or leave the playing surface and then, for example, stepping into the stands to gain an advantage, that is, it is okay. However, if you, it depends on how you want to interpret leaving the playing surface, right? Because, yeah. you know, they obviously think that he's going to get on a chair or something, right, and kind of throw it that way, it sounds like. Whereas he jumps in the air. What do you think about that? Well, you know, most of the uh, violations now, we're back to violations. Most of the violations that occur is the side-to-side -side lateral movement of a thrower in. And it's not exactly a, he has to establish a pivot foot. He just can't move more than about a stride beyond where he's going. He can stride to the right. He can stride to the left like a skip and still get the pass in. I have not seen that being called. And also, I know it to be within the guidelines of strides, the right and to the left. You also can take two or three steps back if you need to after you get the ball uh, in order to make the space I referred to before for the thrower in if his defender is at the line. So the other unusual thing is, now for me, I had no problem with a thrower in jumping up to get the ball over a defender. I mean, uh, I had no problem with it. And as I looked into the rule book, it indicated, of course, what you said, leave the playing surface. And leave the playing surface is kind of unusual to me. And uh, I thought I might be wrong. I was glad to hear that I was correct, that you can jump, apparently, and make a, an entry pass. So I'm more for that. I think that needs a little bit more clarification. Sure. I'm glad that we at least have some precedent now where, you know, in the future, if somebody jumps in the air, we'll know that that's okay. At the very least, whatever it is, we just need to know. And I think this is, this is the good thing out of this is that we're getting a sense of, okay, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot less, you know, uh, mystific, mystification here. We kind of understand yeah. what's happening. Well, the next thing we have here on this list that they have an issue with is the going for the, the, the bad pass. It was a dying quail that he had to throw up to Kevin Durant. Danny Green was on him. And there was some stuff happening there. And the NBA decided that it was a correct uh, no call uh, as they kind of scrum up in the air to get the ball. What are your thoughts on that part of the play? You know, I'm, I'm actually good with that. I looked at that play a little bit more, and uh, it was... It certainly looked like Green was the culprit initially because Durant actually got to the ball. Sometimes when two people are going for the ball and neither one gets it, you're kind of seeing which one could have gotten it and didn't get it. But in this case, Durant got it. There was contact. And on the way down, I see Green really uh, deflect it or out of his hand. It looked legal. Yeah. So um, I think we're splitting hairs on that play. And I can... I can live with a no call on that play and glad to see that the NBA also called it a correct no call. I mean, that's a hustle play, both by offense and defense on a throw in. And I, and I, and I think the play uh, kind of unfolded in the proper way with a no whistle. Absolutely. I agree. I feel like the initial contact was a loose ball. They're you know, both going for it. Again, end of game situation. I know we don't like to always acknowledge or say that perhaps they swallow the whistle, but that just felt like let these guys play. Uh, and uh, by the way, the strip looked really clean. That was very impressive to me as well with Danny Green had the presence of mind to, mind to strip it. Uh, the, the next part on this thing, though, then, is uh, Patty Mills grabs and holds uh, Stephen Adams, affecting his freedom of movement during the inbounds play uh, an incorrect call uh, is what they ruled. So could you spot that part and what was going on there, what you might think the, happened? You know, that was one of the plays that I hadn't noticed. And, you know, here's the, here's the thing. Sometimes you got three referees on the court, and maybe you need five just to, to, to match up with each matchup, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these things are, are a, uh, kind of a, a thing that goes across your mind like a like a blaze or a flare that you're not sure of what happens. And you're also refereeing big, small. I didn't see that play as well. Uh, I will I will uh, acquiesce to the fact that they, they believe there was a foul on that play. And by the way, it's good that they are, are giving the uh, the best of the judgments, uh, you know, uh, you know, which is 2020 hindsight. But I'm glad that they're informing the fans of a play like that. So I'm not too clear on what happened that play from my vantage point. But I like seeing that they admit that that play should have been called 
Mills versus uh, Adams, you said, correct? Yeah, for sure. And I, I agree. I, he had him. He had him wrapped up a little bit. It looked uh, definitely very handsy to me. Uh, certainly, if they, they called that and they went back and looked at it, I'm pretty sure even the, oh, the San Antonio Spurs fans would probably be like, yeah, okay, we can see that. So I, I can see that. Again, it's the end of the situation. They tend to get physical. We, we can recognize that. So it was sort of in line with what they, you know, what we normally see. We saw Draymond Green throw a player down that got did not get a call uh, when they lost the game, uh, uh, Golden State against Houston, uh, which was even worse. And I'm assuming that they said that was a bad call too. Um, so yeah, uh, one, one of the things uh, I wanted to also mention was the key about these plays, uh, off ball, off ball plays before a throw in, is that you're dealing with the away from the play foul. And if, the, and if these fouls are occurring prior to the release of that ball, you're dealing with a whole new animal in terms of the penalty. Yeah. You know, penalize the, uh, the team that, that uh, takes advantage of that is going to the free throw line with their, whatever shooter they like on the court. And also they get possession right back at the same spot. So away from the play fouls in these instances uh, are, not the, are not the Shaq plays so much. These are real active plays. Everybody's involved. Nobody's away. But in fact, uh, the foul that comes before a release is important and uh, it has a it has a big penalty For sure. and so officials have to be uh very vigilant and uh, aware that that they got to see if this occurs that it's the fault of the player and not the fault of the official when he calls it absolutely well we have another play i mean believe it or not there's more we have Kawhi leonard grabbing russell westbrook's jersey which again is a very uh severe penalty isn't a technical foul by doing that uh, no, not in live play. I mean, uh, oh. pulling a shirt is a foul. Okay, so it's a regular foul. But it's an off-ball yeah. foul before the ball was inbounded, right? Yeah, if that's one of the same ones, and we're stuck with that too. And, you know, listen, shirts uh, a few years back when I was involved was the new thing that players were doing. They were grabbing shirts. I don't know if shirts were loose or whatever, but they were grabbing. Because, by the way, uh, you can get really hurt with your fingers if you get your f fingers caught in a shirt of your opponent. And, uh, and that's a problem. But these are actual grabs. It seems like it's creeping back in. And, uh, and if you don't attend to it during the season, guess what happens? It happens in the playoffs when you least want it to because you're not looking for those kind of plays to interrupt the game. And officials are trying not to interrupt the game. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, if there's a shootout in Tombstone Territory and you're the marshal, you got to get out there and quell it. And uh, that, that's the problem with uh, behavior. If you don't if you don't put a cap on it as you go along, it, it gets to lose itself during critical times in the, in the season. For sure. And I, I felt like on that grab, it didn't necessarily impede Russell Westbrook that much uh, for a huge advantage. He just kind of he kept running and, and uh, you know, uh, Kawhi was still right there. So I don't know. I felt like that was a little bit of, uh, you know, I would have seen that in line with like, OK, he got out of there. He didn't really slow down. So you know, it, that would get, it wouldn't be called. However, the NBA thought that was an incorrect call. It should have been called. Uh, again, full speed, tough. It was right in front of the ref, but not easy. Um, let's move on to the next one because there's so many here to get through. Uh, they talk about, um, okay, so we talked about Green and Durant going up and getting for that inbounds pass, and they said it was a cleanly strips of the ball, correct, no call. Uh, then we have Ibaka makes incidental contact with Leonard that does not affect his freedom of movement away from the ball. So did you get a chance to spy what was happening here with Ibaka and Kawhi? Uh, you know, this was, a, this was another thing about grabbing uh, shirts and people, correct? I think I saw some kind of activity in the scrum. This was the, during the scrum, correct? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, this was, uh, you know, at that point in time, I think what's happening is we, officials are trying to see what really is going to come out of this. And if they can find and see that something is is missed or a pass was not be able to take be, be caught or a rebound was not be able to be gotten i think they would react to that then but because uh this play was still open and nothing was happening uh it, it actually it happened uh, did it not happen during mills's shot or it just did. it did in fact if you watch the replay from the baseline angle it's it's not good he's got a handful of jersey and he's yanking on it for a while making it like difficult for uh for Kawhi and, and lamarcus yeah, listen, you know what's happening really in general with, with the staff? Uh, there are philosophies that are going on that are interrupting the, the general strike zone, so to speak. And part of these philosophies is trying not to 
uh, interrupt or create an issue by an official in a game and trying to get this old adage about let the players play. And, and what happens is when we let the players play, the camera and all 10 of them that are probably at this game are your 10 extra officials uh, that also take in the audience to see what's going on. And when you see these particular things not being addressed, it makes it as if the officials are letting plays go for the sake of a sort of a past philosophy that if it's no advantage gained, uh, then don't call it, let the players win the game, and all these other things. And I think what happens is officials are stuck in the vice uh, between these things. And, and I have always said uh, to them that the day of trying to do some of that for the sake of judicious, judiciousness in the game is fine and dandy, but the fact is that these are being notable, seen, and focused upon with great camera work that demonstrates something needs to be called. And uh, we, we continually fall into this. It makes us look uh, less effective, and uh, you just have to call the plays and let the, uh, let the players adjust to what they have done and, uh, and, and, and kind of raise the level of excellence and standards in this because people will begin to think other things are going on, uh, whether it's... Uh, some form of uh, wanting the home team to win, big cities versus uh, small cities, and all the rest of the myths that go on. And all it is is trying to be judicious, but not doing it in a, in a real effective way. Uh, okay, that's a great way to put it. And uh, if we move on to the next thing that they... Certainly, um, as we have what we talked about at the end there, is in that scrum for the loose ball... You know, Ibaka, it's not easy to see. And unfortunately, the, the angles that we got on TNT, uh, we got one good one where you can kind of sort of see that he's got a hold of the jersey for two separate parts of that play. Um, you know, the referee is trying to dig his eyes in there and get in to see what's happening. He's a little bit behind and shielded. Uh, did you get a chance to see that and really see how much jersey Ibaka had in his hand? Oh, yeah. I, I saw a still picture of it. Uh, what I did, I tried to see it along with what was going on. Then later, of course, saw a still picture. A, a, a picture that was still on this play. Again, the official's looking at it, and he's hoping things will unfold without really blowing the whistle on this. And if you notice, each one of these items become built on the other. You know, it's like a pancake deal here. And at the top, uh, you know, there's no honey on this. It's become a soured look and, uh, and probably a sour taste in everyone's mouth on a finish like this when the guys are really much, much better than this, but they keep trying to allow latitude in things. And what happens, it ends up looking, you know, like, like a, a poorly finished, um, I don't know, ju judicious kind of a, a thing about the game of basketball and the officiating in it. If you get the first thing first, which goes back to Ginobili, and you feel that's what it needs, then just call it. And all these other things go away. And... Uh, Mm -hmm. I think there's philosophies going on out there with some of our vets, and, and, and they're hurting some of the people that are now in great positions to, be, to grow. I mean, these are, this is a, uh, with the exception of Kenny Marrott, there's some, you know, two good officials that go beyond, Mark Davis, Sean Corbin bringing up the rear here in this. Uh, but the bottom line is, it, I think there is mixed messages being sent, and uh, the weight is on the guys that are on the floor, and they don't need to carry that weight. I hear you. Well, one last question I have for you then is none of this stuff is reviewable, right? Uh, well, the reviewable could be whether it was two or three on Mills. Um, none of it was reviewable based on the inbound play. You're absolutely right. Uh, so I think in the long run, it's just a matter of the judgment. If there's a foul or, or, or what have you, and I think the only one that could have been was the uh, if Mills had made his shot whether it was a two or a three, and um, they could have looked at it and then seen the foul and then followed up and said Adams did foul him. For sure. Well, to compound that, the clock started late, too, by about 0.8 oh, seconds. Oh, don't <laughs> tell me that. Don't tell me that. <laughs> it, was a, it was a mess, and uh, let's hope we don't see another one of those because it just gets in the way of, you know, good playoff basketball where, you know, one game here or there can decide a whole series. So, uh, it was exciting, and we got a great yes. stuff, and I'm glad. It's really important that you can come on here and give us some, some straight information here and, and also your opinion uh, that we respect so much because I feel like there's still a lot of anger and a lot of confusion, and I know that this will clear up a lot of that right here. Yeah, uh, you know, with respect to the clock also, you know, four people are responsible for initiating the start of that clock. 
any of the three referees. And of course, the table the table law timer can do it. So that's that's one area. And like you say, uh, I think this was unusual. I know these guys have their heads down with such confusion and whatnot. But again, uh, if they can hear me from uh, outside the walls, call the plays, get your plays and don't play games with the game. Just call it. And if the if the murmuring is, well, why did you make that call at this end of the game? The answer is, why did your guy do what he did? And 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 by the way, they stopped doing it, and they play the game. Great game, though, no great question. Game. A great game. Well, great show, great insights, and another great court call. Can't wait to get to the next one. We'll have to find out. I can't believe that we'll have another doozy like this. But uh, terrific stuff. Thanks for coming on the show, Ronnie. And uh, don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel. We're a conversation. You in? Are you in, Ronnie? I am in, Coach, and thank you.